Hey, JD here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've watched over 125 episodes of mead making, education, information, and entertainment. More than 80 guests have stopped by the Mead House. Professional mead makers, medal winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast, and honey specialists have all visited to share their knowledge. The Mead House has produced the home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Mead House by joining the Mead House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Mead House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a keyholder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Mead House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Mead House. Hey, you can listen to the Mead House podcast with your favorite player and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue. The Mead House. Mead making entertainment you just don't want to miss. Hey, welcome to the Mead House, and thanks for listening to episode number 146. Hey, you know where to find us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, all the usual places, and a whole lot more. They're all listed on the front page of the website, themeadhouse.com, The Mead House. You know it's produced for home mead makers, just like you and me, looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. Talk to us on Facebook and Twitter both at the Mead House, or you can just simply email us at the info at the meathouse.com. Info at the meathouse.com. Uh, Jeff and Aaron are in the booth tonight. Uh, Aaron who? I know that's a familiar name to some of our old listeners, but to some of you new listeners, we welcome Aaron Martin. He formerly, uh, former uh, uh, guest, uh, guest, former guest. You weren't a guest. You started out on uh, one of the first shows, didn't you? I think so. One of maybe the it, very first episode. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was right up there in the front. Uh, I think you were with me and and uh, Mississippi, uh, and we started this thing off. Aaron Martin uh, is filling in for Ryan tonight. Ryan's off gallivanting across the country somewhere. So uh, welcome aboard, Aaron, and uh, thanks for filling in for Ryan tonight. Good to be here. All right. My name is J.D. Webb. Hey, in segment one, you know, once in a while, we like to check back in with some former guests that have appeared on the show. And if you recall from episode 104, we had Matt Falensky on. Matt joins us tonight as we catch up with what's happening at Laurel Highlands Meadery in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And in segment two, it's been a while since uh, Aaron was last on the show. We're going to catch up with Aaron and find out what his mead-making endeavors have been and throw it around the table, coming up with some ideas for this year's brewing in, uh, in each one of our brew houses. In segment three, as usual, Facebook friends, this is where we try to answer a few questions with no formal expertise other than what we've experienced in our own brew room. All that and more here at the Mead House. But first, thanks to all the Mead House key holders who help keep the Mead House podcast free. You too can become a Mead House key holder and help support the show for as little as two bucks a month. We've got some great thank you gifts to send out to you. So get on over to patreon.com, search for the Mead House, or just click on the link in the show notes. Uh, This is the part of the show that I really like. Uh, What are we drinking here tonight, guys? Jeff, I'm going to shoot it on over to you. Uh, What's in your cup tonight, man? So I have, in Mead House fashion, two, uh, well, tonight it's actually two cans um, in front of me. I have uh, part of segment two. We are talking about um, inspirations and things we're planning to do in the future to a degree or whatnot. And I have a nice little can here in front of me. Of uh, Rogue's Yellow Snow. Mm. Um, it's a Pilsner brewed with Oregon spruce tips. Um, and I have I have noodled the idea of using spruce tips or fur tips or, you know, yeah. some of these, like, these very young uh, evergreen growth pieces for quite a while. And I think since I am going to reduce the amount I'm brewing this year... Um, 
if funnily enough, I'm going to try that in in one of my next brews because uh, we'll talk more about this in in segment two. Let me get a taste of this. Hmm. It is it's light. Um, I I don't know if they put any hops into this whatsoever. Actually, it, it's uh, the the character is a little bit citrusy. It's very earthy. You know, it, it's it's very light, but it's the character behind it is earthy. Um, there's almost a resinous quality to the flavor too. Um, interesting. I'm 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 not hating this. Um, it's just different than the hops I'm used to for such a light body, easy drinking beer. Uh, the other can in front of me though is just something random that I saw at the liquor store as I was browsing through and went. That looks hilarious and possibly delicious. I'm going to try this out. Um, this is Oscar Blue's Death by King Cake, um, which, of course, is a Mardi Gras reference. Um, they're calling this a an ale brewed with vanilla, cinnamon, nutmeg, cacao nibs, orange peel, and pecans. <laughs> wow. That's uh, a lot going on there. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is a lot of flavors. And, you know, it, it is my general opinion that when you've got more than about three flavors at play, you're risking just muddling them the hell up and not catching any of them correctly. <laughs> so we're going to see right now. Can't wait for this. <laughs> you know, I'm getting some cacao and I'm getting some, I think it's vanilla. You think it's vanilla? <laughs> I, I, vanilla is such a, you know, it's such a supporting player. It boosts everything else without really like playing its own hand. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm getting yeah the the cacao pretty strong. Um, I don't know if I'm getting any orange peel or pecan on this. Let me ask you though, what it's, what it's what temperature what temperature are you are, are you are you drinking it at? Um, probably in the uh, the high forties. You oh, know, it, okay. it's been in the refrigerator for about an hour. Yeah, uh, so yeah. it's not quite you know optimal drinking temperature for a cold beer, but um, yeah. it's colder than. Uh, room temperature it feels cold to the touch yeah uh and you know honestly it's got a good body to it it's very thick i mean this kind of reminds me of that that white stout concept that uh that ryan's been throwing around and that I, you know i've got a i've got a, a braggot in the works that is kind of in the, its its final phases here hopefully we'll have some of that on top soon um uh, yeah no it, it's got a little bit of sweetness it's very like spice forward which is weird for a beer um, yeah, no, this is just a fun little, this is a fun diversion, I think. I, I'm enjoying this for now. The reason why... Did, I, did you say that's a stout? No, no, it, it describes itself as an ale, but it has the same body character of a stout or a porter, if you follow me. It's just a thick tasting kind of feeling beer in my in my mouth. Okay. Um, yeah, I've tried Oscar Blues has a Death by Coconut, and it's not quite the concoction that that sounds like it is, but it's um, I want to say like right. a or stout and uh, a ton of coconut on that. But yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, and I, I kind of assumed you know Death by would be a, a take on their Death by Coconut because their Death by Coconut is fantastic. So that's part of what made me go, okay, well this is probably going to be good. But yes, <laughs> that's what I'm drinking tonight. Reason why I asked you what temperature you're drinking at? Some, you know, I found that sometimes when when I come across something that's got a lot, you know, a, a lot of uh, flavors incorporated into it, uh, sometimes when I let it sit for a little bit and kind of come up a little bit in temperature, usually usually it hits right around the 55, 60 degree range, and then man, all of a sudden pop. All these flavors kind of come into play. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if uh, if you let it sit there for a little bit and, and let it come up, maybe we'll check back in on here in a little while and and see if you yeah, get. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I'm curious. I think I will hang out and uh, work on this pilsner for a little bit and see what develops. Yeah, I'm really curious. I mean, cause it'll, it sounds like a lot going on there. Um, Aaron, you've been mead making for quite some time, at least. Well. Gosh, guys, what's it been? Almost four years, three and a half, four years now with the Meat House. So Aaron was with us in the very beginning, and I know he was probably making mead before then. So uh, what are you enjoying in your glass tonight, Aaron? 
Well, I've got two glasses in front of me as well. I figure um, when in Rome, might as well do as the Romans, right? So uh, <laughs> double fisting it in typical meat house fashion. Um, in one glass, I've got a home brew. This is a passion fruit melomel that a buddy in, of mine and me, uh, we just brewed up a few months ago. It's um, a lighter mead. Uh, we made it with like an early spring wildflower honey that was very, very light, very delicate and floral um, in its flavor. And then um, a passion fruit puree that um, he actually picked up at like a Brazilian supermarket. His, his wife is actually from Brazil. Uh, so passion fruit is uh, a flavor that, that they enjoy in, in a bunch of different recipes, passion fruit. Um, like souffle, uh, passion fruit tea that they do. So, so um, he inspired me to do this, and it's really quite nice. It uh, finished at 1010 for the the final gravity, so a little bit more on the the dry side. But the passion fruit definitely gives it a, a tremendous amount of perceived. I don't want to say sweetness. I would say fruitiness. Um, it's it's tart. It's tropical. Um, but then, like, you, you've got that light, delicate honey kind of playing in the background that gives it almost like a white wine character as well. Um, I, I was telling some of my family, I feel like this has a lot of things that um, you, you would look for in, in, like, a drier white wine. Um, so that's, that's in one hand. In the other hand, um, I've got a beer from one of my favorite local breweries here in, in upstate South Carolina, um, this is called Paper Airplanes from Birds Fly South in Greenville, South Carolina. Mm. Um, it's a 100% Brett Pale Ale. So um, it's, you know, with, with the Brett, it, for me, when I think of uh, my ideal sour beer, this is just right in that sweet spot for me. Like, it is a little bit tart, but not one of those, like, mouth puckering, like, you guys remember those warheads, I think, the, the candy that just you yeah. know, is super, super sour. It's nothing yep. like that. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of tartness, but, um, you know, you, you've got a nice funkiness from, from the bread as well. It um, doesn't say there's any fruit in this, so maybe it's the, the bread that's coming through, but I definitely get some kind of like tropical fruit character in this as well. So uh, definitely a, a delightful pale ale here. So it's not like chewing on a lead pipe. Not that tart, no, right? No, <laughs> not that tart. Exactly. You got it. I've brewed a couple of those. Believe me, it's not good. <laughs> not good. Uh, that kind of rings a bell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, we, some, yeah, some yeah, back, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah, Aaron, <laughs> we're not going to go any further than that either. <laughs> I think that's been... Yep, yep. <laughs> That's been tossed around a show here enough times. I think people finally got it. Uh, anyway, yep. hey, uh, what I'm drinking tonight? Uh, I poured. Um, this is the other. Uh, you know, you guys have been last. Um, I don't know. I think the last few times that I've tasted the port meads, it's always been the black currant and um, uh, uh, plum, black plum. Uh, port mead this time i dug into an almost two-year-old jug uh it's actually one of the it's actually the last glass carboy that i have in the house uh this is the black cherry uh or the uh blackberry and cherry uh port mead that i put together with zinfandel and syrah and uh, some cab uh, grape juice uh, this one was finished with uh, an entire bottle of cognac. Um, it's been sitting on, it started out on some American oak first. It finished on some French oak. Um, and it came in at a whopping 19%. And this was, you know, uh, if you go back a few shows, I, I, don't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, but I think you can just do the search thing on the website and uh, just put in Port Mead. And you'll come up with the episodes that I've talked about these. These are these are really intense uh, projects, and because uh, you're basically coaxing a you know 15% yeast 
to go way beyond, <laughs> you know, uh, it's capability and it takes some doings and, uh, uh, you know, and it was no, it was not a champagne yeast that I used. So, uh, let's clear that out. Cause I know some champagne yeast, it's, you know, pretty easy to get them to go way up. Um, this is, uh, I'm really, really happy with this. It's going on two years old. Um, I think, I think probably about the time I put it in a bottle, I guess. Uh, and it's very fruity up front. Uh, the black, uh, the blackberry is the first thing that hits you. Uh, the cherry kind of plays a close second because the cherries there was there is no cherry juice in there. It actually sat on some tart cherries in secondary for uh, uh, a while, and um, so the tart cherry plays a plays a very nice second fiddle uh, to the blackberry. Um, now at 19%, uh, you know, most, a lot, a lot of port meads, a lot of port wines that I drink are, you know, right in the 20% range. And, you know, they typically come with a burn, uh, you know, usually after the fact, uh, and usually pretty quickly. Well, this one sneaks up on you. So this is a very dangerous adult be beverage. <laughs> okay. Because there is absolutely zero burn, okay, until you get to the very end and you really kind of got to think about it. It's there, uh, but it comes right at the end uh, where you start getting that cognac flavor coming through. And it's just a very slight alcohol, uh, you know, that uh, typical alcohol burn that you get at the very end. And it's very slight. So that's why I say this, this could be a very dangerous uh, adult beverage. Uh, in my other fist, um, you know, you guys know I'm a, I'm a bourbon aficionado and I've got, um, uh, I picked up a bottle of bird dog and this one, uh, is the, uh, uh it's a bourbon whiskey. Uh, it's a, this was the small batch and I can't, uh, I want to say it's about 90, I think it's 90, or no, it's 86 proof, I believe. Without my glasses on, I can't see the uh, the numbers, but I believe it's 86 proof. Um, this is a, the small batch version. Now, they make a 10-year, and then they just make a regular old standard uh, uh, 80 proof uh, uh, bourbon as well. Um, this one's much milder than the 10-year, uh, but it's damn good. Um, you, you get the... Uh, on the initial aroma, you get the the barrel aroma itself. I mean, it, it smells like fresh oak. And then you get a little bit of that char. Uh, a little bit of sweetness comes in on the nose from the vanillin. Uh, you get a little bit of uh, a, almost a real light caramel uh, off of it. Uh, and then the first sip uh, is, is very pleasant. It's very mild, um, almost a light brown sugar to it uh you get hit with the vanillas i mean there's a sweetness right off the top uh bourbons remember 51 percent corn so that's where the bulk of the sweetness is going to come from um and it's just you know you know depending on their fermentation or distilling process uh you know uh, how much of that sweetness they allow to come through this is really good stuff uh so bird dog uh this is the small batch uh, version of uh, their bourbon uh, I encourage uh, anybody to get out there and uh, get yourself a bottle and give it a give it a try. Hey, with us tonight is Matt Falensky, uh, and uh, Matt, um, I know you're sitting there just anxious to tell us what you're drinking tonight. Welcome to the show, and uh, what is in your cup? Oh, thank you for for having me, and. Uh, I guess, as you guys like to say, what is it, double fisting in typical meat house fashion? <laughs> yeah. So, You've been here I've before. Heard that a, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a couple times here. So um, I'm actually having two things. Uh, one is our uh, cherry session mead. Ooh. So it's uh, about 7.5% uh, made with local Pennsylvania wildflower and clover honey. Um, then uh, tart. Uh, Mortemonsi cherry concentrate uh, to just give it that nice little you know, cherry edge. And 
you know, it's just kind of nice, you know, semi-sweeted, light and refreshing. Wow, that sounds really good. Yeah, and then the uh, the other fist, we have uh, a Teddy Bogle Cider Works. Uh, they're actually a relatively new uh, cider producer around us in Acme, Pennsylvania, and uh, doing his caramel apple. So it's mm. it's just absolutely fantastic. It you know has that delicious caramel flavor to it. Uh, the the apples come through nice and bright. Uh, you know, it's you know smooth, light, refreshing too, and it's just pretty awesome. Wow, that sounds good. Uh, and what's what's the temperature back there where you're at? Uh, pretty cold. It's been sitting. It's pretty well. We actually, I, I posted a picture to our Facebook and Instagram the other day on Saturday when we were open. We had our doors open. And we were enjoying 72 degrees in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> there you go. Well, I was just going to say, hey, that's, wow. I was going to say that cider sounds good on a nice cold night, but I guess not, huh? <laughs> no, and it's, uh, it's probably in the, the 40s here now. So yeah. it's not super not cold, bad. but yeah, yeah, but it, you know, definitely, uh, usually needs some, you know, good alcohol to keep you warm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hey, yeah, again, welcome to the show. Um, uh, Laurel Highlands Meadery, uh, catch us up, Matt. Uh, what's been going on? Uh, anything new? Yeah. So, uh, what we actually have done is we have opened our second tasting room now, which mm. is our primary uh, production facility, uh, and that's located in South Greensburg, Pennsylvania. So we actually bought the building uh, probably about a year and a half ago, and you know, spent half a year. You're kind of just fixing everything, you know, building it up, getting it to you know, the point that you know we could actually, you know, have production there as well as our tasting room. So at this point, as of late September, you know, we opened our tasting room there, and you know we've just been you know, doing a great job there. A lot of you know a lot of people coming in, a lot of people have no idea what meat is and you know we're introducing them so you know we we just love doing that yeah do you find that the uh, uh with, with with respect that you know people haven't heard of me before or anything how how easy of a sell is it uh mm -hmm. to uh, encourage people to try meat are they pretty receptive to something drinking something they've never heard of before so that's a really interesting question. Uh, when when we first opened in uh, 2010, 2011, absolutely everybody was like, what's mead, what's mead, what's mead? So we spent a lot of time you know, educating people. Now, just with everybody that's making you know, great mead, uh, everybody that is just, you know, getting the mead word out there, it's so so much easier now. Um, I've seen such a change in the last three years. You know, you would typically ask somebody, oh, have you ever had mead before? And they said, no, what's that? Now it's, oh, you know, I've heard of it. You know, I've had one or two, but, you know, I just, you know, I don't know where to get it. Yeah. So, you know, we still have that kind of, you know, mead drought going on there. Right. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that has everything to do with distribution. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not like wine distribution or beer distribution. It's a little bit tougher, I think, to distribute mead uh, because there's just not a lot of it being made. I mean, you can't make a lot of it at one time, you know, like a winery or, or, or a, you know, big brewery. Uh, so distribution mm -hmm. is, is part of the problem, you think? Uh, that's definitely part of it. You know, in, in Pennsylvania, we actually have it fairly easy. Uh, where the the laws for the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board are kind of weird because anything under eight percent is considered mead in Pennsylvania, and it's also considered a malt beverage. Oh, really? The re the reason it's considered a malt beverage is breweries can also make mead. And they can be sold in beer stores. Uh, you know, so, wow. you know, Pennsylvania, we have our state stores which sell you know the the wines and you know the sure. 
you know, the higher alcohol, and then we have the beer stores that sell the low, lower alcohol beer, you know, ciders and, you know, meads there. So it's, you know, it's just very confusing. Everything <laughs> above 8% is actually considered a honey wine. Wow. So that hmm. doesn't necessarily help with people trying to understand what mead is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just getting the just getting the word. I must, you know, the reason why I ask is be, I want to understand how how things have changed in the last about well, ten years since you, since you've been uh, involved with this. And it sounds like people are discovering it a, a little bit more. Uh, I mean, obviously they're 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 getting it somewhere. So uh, you know, I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, uh, we try to do our part as a home meat maker and sharing with friends and relatives, that's pretty, that's a pretty small, uh, that's a, you know, when you look at the, I guess the global scope of things, it's a pretty small, you know, group that you're, that you're actually dealing with. But, um, I'm glad to hear that more people are, 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 uh, getting more, uh, more educated about mead and, and at least trying it out. So that's a good thing. Oh, absolutely. We we get a lot of people that come in, you know, they're carrying a bottle with them and they're like, I would like you to try this. You know, I've been making mead for, you know, a year, two years, five years, and you uh they just you know, they don't have anybody else that can really critique it or try it. And yeah. you know, I'm always excited when people, you know, bring stuff in for us to try too. Wow, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh Aaron, uh kick out over to your side of the house there, bud. Yeah. So Matt, you know, I did a little bit of homework leading up to the episode tonight and went back and, and listened to episode 104 when, when you were on last. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was how much you like to experiment. You know, I, I know you talked a lot about, you know, trying different types of yeasts, different types of ingredients, different types of honey. Um, but one one thing I wanted to pick your brain on is I, I noticed you have several meads that you sell at the meadery there where you're combining different flavors. So some of the, the combinations are maybe a little bit more, I would say, like straightforward in terms of pairing. So like cinnamon and vanilla. Um, there are some that are maybe a little bit more unusual and interesting, ginger hibiscus. Um, you have like a spiced holiday mead with like nutmeg, cinnamon that, that's aged in a bourbon barrel. And then one that, that really jumped out at me as being, you know, fairly unique as well, a, a hopped chocolate cherry. So I, I wanted to ask, like, when you are selecting different types of flavors like that and, and you're putting together like experiments, what kind of goes through your, your head when you're you're deciding on what types of flavors to pair with one another, uh, that that's a really good question. And my wife asks me that all the time. What the hell is going through <laughs> your mind? Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I get that too sometimes. And when I'm cooking dinner, <laughs> uh, and I I think with with that, it's just you know flavors that that I've tried. You know, flavors that I like. Uh, and then it's like, well, oh, wonder what happens if, you know, if we, you know, mix these two together, you know, ferment them together, or even you know, blend them together. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, having a having a good time. And like, I I honestly have a list, you know, that's probably five pages long of flavors that I want to try at some point. Uh, I don't know when we'll get to all of those, but you know, it's just. You know, things that I, I think are interesting or flavors that I think complement one another. And you're just, just having fun with it. Excellent. Um, you know, one, one question I would have as a professional mead maker, do you find that, you know, your, your time is spent on your tried and true recipes that, that you're producing for production and, and to sell to, to customers versus, like, does that detract or take away from your time at home where, where you can tackle some of the, the items on your to-brew list? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, so Ryan and I were actually talking a little bit, and you know, it was kind of about you know the simplifying and streamlining. And you know, some of the things that, that we've done you know, uh, would be... Uh, 
just trying to make everything at the meadery a little bit easier. Um, you know, whenever you know I make a homebrew batch, you know, it's using all sorts of you know different types of honey in different amounts. But you know, at the meadery, we pretty much only use wildflower, clover, and orange blossom honey. So yeah, we'll we'll do some you know varietals that would be like you know the Zambian you know wildflower or uh, you know, blueberry blossom, things like that, that we typically will make a traditional out of. Like, we like to do a lot of the traditionals, you know, with one variety of honey and, you know, make it with that, back sweeten with that, and, you know, just let everybody try what that honey is like. Uh, but, you know, typically what, what we're doing is we're making, you know, like, large batches of mead, two, 250 gallons, and then we'll actually take those and break them down, and that's where we'll make a lot of the other flavors, like the cinnamon vanilla or the ginger, you know, the ginger hibiscus or you know, chocolate oak, what have you. And you know, I think that a lot of other you know, commercial meteries do the same thing, where it just it kind of makes it a little bit easier because you have you know this large batch that you can then break down into some smaller ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the uh, pictures of the last show, we uh, broke out the new year talking, you know, uh, about some of our resolutions and, and relevations and revelations and whatnot. And uh, we kind of ran around the table, uh, each one of us. And, uh, you know, we, we have each, each one of us have just acquired uh, sometimes just too much stuff. And so, oh, that's it, yeah. you know. So the streamlining thing, I mean, it's a good segue. You talk, you know, you mentioned uh, the streamlining thing. Uh, Ryan says that you're involved in, in trying to streamline the metery. Uh, some of the things that we talked about, like, you know, I mentioned that I've got one glass carboy left. Uh, after, you'd have to go back a few shows, but, uh, and I'm going to diss on Ryan here. Uh, Ryan <laughs> is really bad with anything glass. <laughs> He's busted, I don't know how many big, uh, I think one was a six-gallon, one was a five-gallon glass carboy, full. Okay, not empty, full. And uh, oh. so, oh, my God. And so that 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 told me something. And, uh, you know, I, I have arthritis in my hands, and I'm lifting these glass carboys, you know, uh, and I thought, you know, one of these days, I'm going to pull a Ryan and it's going to be all over the floor. And so I thought, you know what? I need to get smart. So I started swapping out all of my glass carboys for kegs. I mean, they're stainless steel or virtually unbreakable. Um, you know, they've got a, a, a nice secure lid on them. that doesn't come loose. Um, you know, you can even fit them. You can even get lids, uh, with, uh, holes drilled in them for airlocks, uh, and what have you. Uh, they even make valves now that you can actually uh, uh, screw in in place of the uh, the gas release that will actually give you, you know, you can dial it in or out uh, however many pounds you want to release. Um, so that's what I, you know, that's part of my streamlining approach in my own little metery here at home uh, is just narrowing down things. And I'm, I've, I've got way too many kegs and carboys, uh, you know, well, I don't have any carboys, but I know I got way too many kegs for sure. But what kind of things have you been doing at the meadery and how would those might tie into a home mead maker? Uh, things that you've thought about there, streamlining your own, uh, uh, you know, product, uh, productivity there at the meadery. How, how, anything that you would, you would correlate back to a home mead maker at all? Uh, I th I think a couple of the things would be every you know would be from like a, even a recipe standpoint where you know you said you're doing you know you're doing things in kegs now yeah it would just be kind of standardizing on you know what size batches you make you know either be you know one gallon three gallon five gallon you know whenever I started out I was you know making a gallon batch then a two gallon batch and a three gallon batch and I had all these you know different batches going at one time and I didn't have anything to rack it into 
you know, so I'd be racking like a one gallon into you know, like a five gallon bucket, and then I'd be like, oh, what, where the hell am I going to, you know, do yeah. this now? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, I think it's everything from you know, just having the equipment you use or you need, and then actually using the equipment you have rather than you know always needing to get you know something bigger or, or better. Uh, I know that probably goes against what everybody wants to do out there. You know, they keep wanting to you know, make bigger and better. Uh, but well, it's, I, I, you, you know, know, Matt, actually you make a good point because this plays right into my wheelhouse right here in my own little metery, my, my own little, little Bruce station. Um, I got so involved in this. Uh, I've got two stainless steel fermenters. I've got, you know, I went through the whole DIY thing about this whole cooling thing. You know, I spent the money and got a, a uh, it's basically a, a uh, hydroponics chiller. I, it, I mean, it goes all the way down to like 36 degrees. I mean, I can chill both of my fermenters down to 38 degrees, both of them. And they're, they're both seven-gallon fermenters. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I thought, you know, I'm going to get into this brewing thing big. The problem is that's how I wound up with, like, you know, six or seven five-gallon carboys, three or four three-gallon carboys, and a crap load of one-gallon carboys filled with stuff that I never even drank. And, oh, I was, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with, like, 50 gallons of stuff, and I'm thinking, well, who's going to drink all this, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, it's just, I know having you know, having that you know is you know, kind of stock as reserves is always a good thing, but yeah, like right now we're in the process of you know trying to sell our house, so we're going through our our basement, and oh my god, you know we just have case upon case upon case. Luckily, some of them are actually labeled with what's in it. Most of them aren't, so. <laughs> You know, we're we're drinking things that we don't know what it is, and you know, it, it's unfortunate. Some of it's really good, some of it isn't so good, but it, it's just to that point where you know, you're just making so much that you're not consuming it as fast as you're making it. Yeah. And you know, of course, you know, mead you know can age, um, but some meads aren't meant to age. You should just enjoy them, right? You know, to to enjoy them. Yeah, I mean, with respect to my two port mead projects, I mean, those are the only two ones that, you know, that that I would consider keeping on, you know, in an aging program. But, I mean, the rest of it, I mean, I want I want to drink it. I don't want it sitting in a carboy for or a keg for, you know, six eight months, a year, two years. You know, I make it to drink, and I, I mean, I've shared it with all the neighbors. I mean, they all know where to come to get free booze. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, Jeff, jump in here, bud. Uh, uh, toss it over your side of the house, man. And Jeff's probably on mute. He's doing a little bit of homework for the oh. show. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I, you know, in, in um, glancing over your, your biography there, and you mentioned you had a, uh, I think it was a cherry session mead. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to session meets and stuff like that? I think that is, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we're talking about streamlining. We're talking about making the things that we want to drink and so that we can, you know, turn these over and empty these kegs. I'm leaning hard on these session meets and things like that, these lower ABV ones. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts from a professional standpoint as to, you know, what makes a good session meet and how you want to uh, approach that as far as getting a lot of flavor for very little alcohol. Yeah, I, I think that session meads are absolutely fantastic because, you know, you can go and have, you know, a glass or two of a high alcohol one and, you know, you can be, you know, completely trashed. Or, you know, you can have a couple of these, actually enjoy it, you know, uh, you know, kind of use it as maybe a lawn mowing, you know, mead in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, typically what we like to do is it will – you know, typically always be a lot lighter. Um, you know, it's never going to be super heavy, super sweet, cloying. Uh, you know, we usually shoot for you know seven and a half percent alcohol, uh, and you know we use a lot of you know fruit purees in you know in the final uh, kind of aging part. Uh, it's you know, kind of like I talked about earlier. You know, we make those large traditional batches. You know, that's not necessarily just the high alcohol, but that's also the low alcohol. 
So, you know, we'll have a, a base mead that we can actually add, you know, the different, you know, fruit, you know, purees, fruit flavor to, uh, and just, you know, play off of that. Uh, you know, it's typically, you know, we're, you know, making the mead to that seven and a half percent. So we're not diluting with any water you know we we don't add anything you know but honey you know for back sweetening um we'll actually we do one that's you know uh, a french oak so it it almost you know drinks like a champagne just that really nice you know taste uh you you get the oak you know a little bit of you know yeast on that uh it's just really nice mm-hmm. But it, you know, it's typically, typically, you know, just, you know, making, you know, a regular mead that would, you know, come in at seven and a half percent. We do use sorbate and sulfite in that, in addition to, you know, sterile filtration, because, you know, the yeast will definitely consume more than that seven and a half percent sugar whenever we're back sweetening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need to make sure that yeah. that's not going to continue fermenting and you know, shoot up to, you know, 10, 12 percent. You, uh, you're, you're carving uh, your session meads, right? Or no? Yeah, yeah. So all, all of our session meads are, are carbonated. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we, we do, you know, anywhere from, you know, 15 gallons to, you know, 60 gallons at a time on that. And, it all really just depends on what you know what the flavor is and you know kind of how popular it is. Uh, unfortunately, we're finding out that pretty much all of them are popular. You know, it's <laughs> keeping up is getting pretty tough for this, but yeah, you know, it's a it's a challenge we're up for. So, well, isn't that a good, good thing to have? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's, definitely. That's say. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm almost anywhere, and I'll get a text or you know a voicemail. It's like, hey, we're out of mead. We need something. What do you got? So, <laughs> you know, and yeah, you know, there are times it's just like you know, it doesn't seem to end, but that's a that's a beautiful thing. Well, that's a yeah, that's a good problem to have, uh, you know. But it goes kind of kind of goes back to you know what we we're talking about earlier, you know, uh, getting people uh, educated and turned on to mead. I mean. Uh, so, you know, it sounds like from that standpoint, at least more people are finding out about this stuff. They seem to be enjoying it and they're coming back for more. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's kind of a good thing. I mean, you know, I mean, I have, I haven't done it yet, but you know, my wife and I go out to dinner frequently and I have yet to, to sit down at dinner and ask for a glass of mead, uh, and, uh, have the, uh, the bartender or whoever the server asked me, gee, what's that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And unfortunately that's around us. That's pretty much still the case. It's yeah. Most of our customers are, you know, are brew pubs, breweries. Um, we have very few restaurants that, you know, actually, you know, have, have mead. Uh, years ago, we actually were in a couple restaurants with you know our higher alcohol you know bottles, and we we went there and we're like oh we'd we'd like a glass of mead and you know the waitress looks at you like what the heck is that <laughs> you know and yeah. they say oh well you know you, you should ask the bartender and the bartender says oh yeah I think they're they're in a box down here in a box you know, <laughs> yeah. And oh. that's one of the problem is that, you know, everybody knows what beer is. Everybody knows what cider is. Everybody right. knows what wine is. Mead is still, you know, kind of up and coming. So it's, it's definitely getting there, but it's not there yet. Well, you know, it sounds like we're making progress. Uh, um, just, you know, awesome progress. Yeah. I mean, long road to go yet, but uh, I mean, it's getting there. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, look anybody in the face and ask them if they've ever had any mead and they stare you back and what the hell is that? Uh, yep. you know, nowadays, even I, you know, my travels around, I run into people, uh, you know, and, and, uh, start talking about mead. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. And, uh, but you know, we have the same problem that, that most places do. It's hard to find. I mean, you know, I recall a number of years ago, uh, harassing the crap out of, the people over one of my to- local total wine stores over here, uh, 
uh, about carrying meat on a shelf. Well, you know, it took them a while. And then, you know, the one day I went in there armed to the teeth, ready to do battle again. Lo and behold, here's this entire bottom shelf of this one rack full of mead. And I thought, aha, paid off. So, uh, you know, not that you got to get to that point to, you know, I mean, I, I was polite about it, but, um, you know, I mean, it was just constantly just getting on them about, hey, you know, when are you going to put some meat on a shelf? And that's, you know, that's all you got to do. Uh, just keep asking for it and keep asking for it. Let's throw it around the table one more time uh, before we let Matt go tonight, guys. Uh, Aaron, uh, throw the mic over to your side. Uh, anything you got for uh, Matt before we uh, let him go? Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, one uh, one question that I did want to ask. So one thing I, I've kind of got in my hopper of, to brew with here is um, like a spicy, fruity kind of a mead where I'm mixing some fruit and, and some chilies, some, some hot peppers together. And I, I know you have a habanero mead um, that, that's part of your standard offering. With your experiments, have you ever combined fruits and peppers together? And, and if so, did you have any combinations that, that you thought worked well? Uh, with that one, the only thing that we've really done would be like a mango habanero. And it that was really, you know, delicious. Uh, probably was a little bit heavier than what I would have wanted. Uh, but, you know, it's... That's about the only the one that we've made. You know, I've I've done a lot of you know different hot pepper meads. You know, most of them, or pretty much all of them, don't actually make it to you know the commercial side. But you know, have done the you know ghost pepper and you know seven pod and you know reaper and you know like you name it. Where typically we're going more for the pepper flavor the pepper aroma, you know, you get the heat, but that's not what we're shooting for. With these, it was, you know, we're shooting for heat, and if you get pepper, you're lucky. Um, nice. Nice. And, and I remember I've, you mentioning the, the last episode, you'll you'll take out the seeds and, and stems and, and so on and so forth. Have you ever tried, like, roasting the peppers or, or smoking them or anything like that as well, or no, and I'm I'm trying to talk the wife into buying a smoker, and she doesn't want to for whatever weird reason. Uh, but I, I definitely want to try. You know, one one I want to try is like a, a smoked peaches and you know habaneros. Oh yeah, uh, Ooh, that yeah, one delicious. That one's kind of been yeah, on my yeah, radar for a while. Uh, but I, I would absolutely love to try, you know, you know, some smoked, you know, peppers, uh, even some, you know, smoked fruit, like, you know, the smoked, you know, peaches is, is something that I definitely want to try. Excellent. Yeah, sounds like that would be a, a really neat pairing and, and something I'll have to, to consider adding to, to the brew list here as well. Um, you know, one, one last thing here, you know, we were talking about streamlining the meadery and, and things like that, and um, not really a question, but more a comment here on, on my own personal experience. So about three years ago when I when we moved from Wisconsin down to South Carolina, uh, it kind of forced me to look at how all of the equipment that I have, you know, how I organize things, how I stored things, and I'll tell you when, um, in the last house that we had, we had this pretty decent sized basement which was good and bad. It was good in the sense there was tons and tons of space and I could really sprawl out all of my carboys and different, you know, buckets or containers of honey and, uh, you know, stirring stick and, and all the, the equipment. But then when we moved here, we, we no longer had that basement. So uh, it, it kind of forced me to, to look at how I organize things. And, um, you know, I, I've, in previous episodes, talked a little bit about my profession being, uh, you know, working in manufacturing and, and being an industrial engineer. And one of the things we'll we'll talk about sometime is the the concept of five S. Um, it's doing a quick Google search here because I can never remember it, but it's like sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. And uh, just in, in kind of simple terms, what it really boils down to is like in 
in a workstation, having like a an organized location with you know labels where where different equipment gets stored and, and things like that. And the idea is by having things standardized and, and set in order like that, they can improve efficiency because you're not spending time thinking like, oh, where did I I leave my bucket or where did I leave this piece of equipment? It, it's just all all in order. Uh, so so when we moved to this this place, I had, I had to kind of downsize. I didn't want to get rid of any equipment, but I had to make it fit into a smaller space. So um, part of what, what I did to streamline my own home injury was, uh, you know, we got some different like shelving units, and I, I haven't admittedly gone as far as having labels for everything, but everything does have like a, a standard location. So I've got like my five gallon carboys here, my three gallon carboys there, um, I've got all of my you know, bottle, 12 ounce bottles in, in one area, 24 ounce bottle, bottles in another area. Um, I've even got these like plastic totes where, you know, we, we store the different like <laughs> chemicals, potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, um, bottle caps, and, and all of those are, are in their own like plastic totes. So for me, like, that, that's something that I've done that, that I found has been really beneficial in terms of streamlining is, um, just kind of giving some some thought to how I'm organized, and, and I do find that on brew day I, I spend a lot less time like running around like a chicken with my head cut off looking for stuff because it's all all kind of in order. So um, just circling back to that com or the the discussion point earlier. Good. Yeah, we we do the same thing where you know we have everything kind of organized we have everything you know even even planning out you know what what we're going to be brewing you know the fermentation schedule uh, but it's yeah making sure that everything is neat and organized where you know we actually have a lot of room now and we could just pack that with crap you know there but you, you know we we don't we try not to do that uh, you know I'm Unfortunately, it was somewhat of a pack rat, but I'm I'm trying to break that bad habit. Uh, yeah, it's just making sure that you know you're keeping the things you need to keep and getting rid of the things you don't need anymore. And you know, if you Absolutely. look at something and it's like someday I'll use this, and you know, six years later you're looking at it and saying someday that yeah, might be time to get rid of that. Someday never comes, does it? Yep, exactly. <laughs> I'm the same way. I got stuff in boxes, you know, uh, in, in little Tupperware containers and whatnot. That well, I better hang on to this. I better hang on to that. You know, I, I dig through it three years later, and stuff that I've you know I haven't seen for three years. It's like what what did I need this for? Uh, so I get that uh, absolutely, Jeff. Uh, yep. Last words, bud. Absolutely, same here. Uh, there is stuff that I I keep like on a high shelf, like. I'm going to brew something with that one day. And yeah, it never comes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, as far as um, final questions, a, a, a real common one we ask here, you know, for not necessarily beginner mead makers, but mead makers that are kind of, they got a couple batches under their belt and they're looking to get a little bit more serious about it, uh, maybe go pro, maybe just, you know, start making more meat at home like we're doing. Um, any any big tips that you think uh, from your experience have been like real insightful um, things that you've, you've learned over the course of your meat making career? I think one would be to find like-minded individuals that want to do the same thing. Uh, you know, we actually have a, a BJCP meat judge group that we've put together and you know it's been meeting at the meadery now for the last few months and it's just really awesome you know with kind of meeting all those people like a lot of them are, are beer people already uh, some of them have made a mead some some haven't made mead but it's just you know kind of getting together you know everything from from talking to actually making mead to you know sharing recipes or insights or maybe flavors uh, you know, helping troublesh troubleshoot flaws. Uh, we actually had one, like the the first one that we've ever had that you know kind of went south, tasted like corn chips. 
you know, and <laughs> we just couldn't couldn't figure it out. Wow. St- still don't have an exact idea of what happened, uh, you know, but you know we're we're trying to figure it out. But one of the other guys had the exact same kind of issue, and you know, so we're able to kind of sit down and say, okay, well, I did this, this, and this, and he said, oh, well, I did this and this. So you know, you kind of you know get to you know the the root of the problem. It's even as you know, like we we've, we've mentioned, you know, meat isn't everywhere out there. So other people bringing meat in for you to try, you know, maybe you've never tried, you know, this strain of yeast or or this fruit, and you know they have. So you know, just getting to try different meads. Um, but I think you know. It's also just experimenting. You know, don't always just read a recipe. You know, kind of figure out what you like. You know, read about what you know what the yeast can do, and just you know, kind of experiment. You know, don't don't go and make you know a twenty gallon batch, but you know those one gallon batches are nice whenever it's a yeast maybe you've never used before, or honey that is maybe either too expensive or something you've never used. But yeah, just you know, experiment and have a good time with it. That's that's what this is all about. Absolutely. We're going to leave it right there, Matt. Uh, but do me a big favor. Go ahead and plug the meadery and uh, tell us where uh, everybody can find you and uh, make sure you include the website too. All right. So we are Laurel Highlands Meadery, and our tasting room is in Irwin, Pennsylvania. Uh, and our production and tasting room is in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And we can be found at laurelhighlandsmeadery.com. And you know, we hope to see you all there soon. Absolutely. Matt, welcome back to the show. Thanks again for uh, joining us here uh, tonight here at the Mead House. You're always welcome, my friend. We'll keep the seat warm for you all the time. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. You too. Thanks. All right. Uh, Matt Solansky, guys. Uh, you know, uh, I remember that first uh, time he was here, episode 104, and uh, for our, our listeners, go back and check that episode out. Um, uh, this guy's really got it going on, and uh, we had a good time with him last time. Always fun to talk to. Uh, really uh, enjoyed having him here uh, at the house tonight, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have him uh, back again in the future. Um with that, moving on, guys. Uh, you know, it's been a while since uh, Aaron started out. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I haven't told. I guess the story started uh, back when I was producing another show. I left that show, and one of the guys that used to call in all the time, Mississippi, uh, he got a hold of me one time. He says, hey, you're going to do another podcast. And I said, I don't know. He says, well, you should. So I said, well, Will, if you'd be on it. And so uh, he committed to it. Aaron, I don't even remember, dude, how we even found you. Uh, you know, I I can't remember. If you remember, back in the day, it was uh, I had posted in one of the Facebook groups uh, kind of a little experiment I was working on with, like, some different honey varieties and yeah. different uh, traditional meads. And, and then you had reached out and asked, hey, you want to join us on this show? And yeah, that's what, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and we started uh we started the meat house. It was me and and you and uh uh Mississippi uh and then we brought Ryan or no, I guess we got Bre- uh, got Jeff involved. Uh yep. and then uh <laughs> yep. Yeah. And yep. Then Ryan joined. Uh Aaron uh Aaron picked up and moved um and uh we kind of lost touch with him. Actually, I didn't lose touch. I've been following you on Facebook, and um, you know, he after he left the show, I mean, this cat could brew a mead like something else. And I, I remember you're the one, you're the you're the responsible party for me getting involved in these braggots, Uh because it was your <laughs> braggot that that just was phenomenal. I still remember that to this day. And so, oh, you know, I'm I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm kind of following. You know where where Aaron's at. And next thing I know, he's brewing peppers. He's making his own Tabasco sauce. And I thought, dude, this this cat 
he's got it going on, man. Uh, so, uh, besides the hot peppers, uh, what's been going on there in uh, South Carolina? What have you brewed? Uh, what do you want to brew? And uh, what's on the uh, what's on the recipe list? Absolutely. Well, so I alluded to uh, one of the the recent brews um, the, that we put together here at the beginning of the episode. It was that passion fruit melamel uh, put together with um, with a buddy of mine, and um, you know I, I think one of my uh, favorite styles of, of meat are these melamels that are standard strength, so the so wine strength coming in anywhere yeah. you know twelve to to fourteen percent. So this is no different than that. Um, as far as some, some other things that, that I have going, so I think the, the last time that I was on the show, we talked a little bit about this concept that I had for um, like a, a cherry, like a, a smoked chili cherry mead. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a commercial mead that I tried, I want to say it was from Bean Nectar that was like a, a cherry chipotle mead that it just blew my socks off. I mean, it, it was sweet, with just dripping with, with honey flavor, but then you, you had that nice tart acidity from the cherries, and then on the back end, just a, a nice gentle burn, um, and, and then just a smokiness that kind of carried all the way through. So um, actually in the fermenter right now, I, I want to say it's maybe three weeks into primary, um, I finally got around to, to putting that together. So at this point, it's um, it's a mead that I, I did with RC212 yeast, and um, I didn't use any water in this. I, I just no. used, if you've gone to the, the grocery store, you'll, you'll see those glass jugs of 100% tart cherry juice. Yep. Um, I used probably like 85 to 90% tart cherry juice and maybe 10 or 15% of black cherry juice. Um, and then for honey, uh, there was this uh, kind of a, a late fall um, wildflower honey local to, to the area here that I picked up at a, a farmer's market. Um, and I think the guy I bought it from said it was like tulip poplar honey, oh. real dark, dark honey, very mm. rich. I would I would almost say chocolatey. So wow. um, I, I used that honey in this and uh so that's been bubbling away, and uh, I'm I'm very eager to um, to see how that turns out. I think it's it's about a four gallon batch, so I think I'm going to split it out into four one gallon batches and um, test out <laughs> something. I, uh, you know, we with uh, with Matt on, I was asking if you know, if he's roasted peppers or smoked them, and, and definitely I've yeah. got like a whole gallon bag of, of smoked peppers. But I was thinking what I might do is in, in one gallon, um, try out just smoked peppers right out, out of the smoker and, and then into the freezer, see what happens if I toss some of those in. But then uh, dehydrating some of the peppers as well and uh, see see how that turns out in, in another mm. gallon batch. And then um, I was thinking too, like, you know, it seems like more and more, maybe in the last year or year and a half, it seems like more and more people are talking about using chocolate and mead, cocoa right. nibs, right. And, and I was thinking chocolate cherry sounds pretty good. So uh, maybe I'll I'll try that. And then for the, the fourth gallon, I, I may just leave that alone. It's just a, a plain cherry mel um, just to, mm-hmm. to kind of see how that comes together. But um, that, that's kind of what I've got going on now. And um, there's there's actually a, a couple other brews I, I have um, in mind. Kind of excited to to share these concepts with you guys as well. Uh, you know, I, as I as I kind of reflect on a lot of the needs that, that I've done, they tend to be a lot of traditionals and a lot of like one ingredient needs. So like a a raspberry mead mm-hmm. or blackberry mead, blackcurrant mead. And I haven't done a lot of things where I'm combining two or more ingredients. Right. Um, so, so uh, actually, my father-in-law got like a a whole bunch of figs at, at a pretty good deal, 
and actually he's storing them for us right now in his freezer. I think it's like a, a gallon size of frozen figs. And I was oh, thinking wow. of doing like a like a fig pudding kind of style mead with maybe some cocoa nibs, mm -hmm. vanilla beans, some some oak, and yeah. uh, some some stuff like that. I can get behind um, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kind of excited to, to see how that turns out. I actually have a little more of this um, this wildflower honey that is so chocolatey and dark. I think that might pair very well with the figs. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I, and I, um, actually, if, uh, one one other I'll, I'll throw out there for you guys too. So. One thing I, I also want to experiment with, and, and I think you guys may have touched on this last week in the New Year's, um, Jeff might have touched on this, the New Year's resolution episode. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of these too, Jeff, where it's like these like 14% meads, 12% meads, and um, I think you were talking about this where, you know, you, you have one 12-ounce bottle of that or, uh, you know, a couple bottles and... and uh, right. That you you feel pretty good after that, and, and sometimes I I just want to have have a little bit more. So I, I want to experiment with some more like session style needs. So uh, let me throw this out to you guys. I, I know on the show we've we've done some some different hopped needs before. Um, one thing that kind of stands out to me for like some of these different you know new IPA styles are these like tropical fruit IPAs where like guava IPAs, and, and I just did this uh -huh. passion fruit thing. Um, so, so I was thinking of doing something. Let, let me throw this out there: Galaxy Hops, which is like a really high alpha acid hop. Like, yeah, right. I want to mm -hmm. say like eighteen percent or something like that alpha acids. Strawberries and passion fruit in like a, a session mead. So maybe you know, seven and a half, eight percent with strawberries, passion fruit, and, and galaxy hops. What what do you guys think of that? I'm kind of like Remind a, me what tasting notes you're getting off of the galaxy. I, what, I think passion fruit passion believe. fruit was one of the descriptors on, on that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So how much hops? Uh, I mean are you looking for something IPA level or are you looking for I mean how 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 out there do you want to get with the hops? Yeah, I I am a, a hop head. I would describe okay. myself as so definitely like the <laughs> you know the, the IPAs that are are bitter. Um, yeah, yeah. More more like boiled hops probably versus like dry hops is, is probably where my head's at with this. Um, I'd have to pull up a, a recipe. I want to say is I recently did another hop mead where I I used maybe. Um, Six ounces total of, of uh, three different kinds of hops in, wow. in like a five gallon batch. I may even push beyond that, to be honest. With wow. You, you know what? Uh, well, I think you should put it together and send my wife a bottle because she's a hop head. Too. There you go. <laughs> send one my way as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think strawberry and passion fruit are both kind of delicate flavors when it comes to fruit. And you may be in a, a case where um, you know, a lot of hops might might fight with that, or might uh, might might lose some of that. You might wind up needing to back sweeten a bit to get those fruit flavors to come back out. But it still sounds like a worthwhile try. I mean, it, you know, the the flavor combinations are there, and I think yeah, especially you know if if Galaxy is the one you're looking at, uh, go for it. Uh, there are definitely a a whole host of it occurs to me like these uh, the, the the New Zealand and Australian hops that have all these tropical fruit aromas mm -hmm. and flavors to them um, could play nicely there too. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely worth a shot. That's yeah, yeah. Oh, and and one other thing I was thinking about with this this project, um, I did get like a heating system or a heating setup as well. Um, I, I think mm -hmm. last time I was I was on I was talking about getting like a, a ceramic heater yep. that I could plug into my temperature controller and, and stick that in my my chest freezer. So I, I went ahead and did that. It's been working out well so far this winter. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, you know, now I, I could easily shoot up to ninety degrees, oh, hundred yeah, degrees. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. And I have 
Yes. I have not played with any of these Kavik yeast yet. You've got to do it. Um, but and you, you, oh yeah, it's a game changer. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you gotta you gotta try that, uh, Aaron. Uh, you'll be you'll be amazed. I mean, you will simply be amazed. I mean, that's besides California, uh, the California zero zero one from White Labs, and the Caviques, and my uh, uh, Nottingham for my ciders. Those are my three go to yeasts now. Those, those that's it for me. Matt, those, those are the yeasts that I like. Uh, I love using them, so. It sounds like you got some pretty worthwhile projects on. Uh, one last comment about the hot sauce. I, you know, I thought, you know, if Aaron Martin can do this, I can do it too. So, wife and I went out and we bought a whole bunch of of peppers and we brought them back and we fermented them. And now, my wife. Okay, you got to understand. My wife is the kind of gal. She's a Native American Indian. And I don't know what it is about uh, about Native American. Apparently, she likes hot sauce too. I mean, she loves this stuff. Okay, so you'll go out and get a bottle nice. of the sriracha. You know, it comes in a little plastic squeeze bottle. All right, so you'll sit there and put the sriracha uh, chili on a on a on a uh, uh, on a rich cracker and eat them just like that. Okay. <laughs> she is a, a woman. Okay, so a woman after my own heart. Okay, I, you know I do that too. I do that with like broccoli and like. Oh my god, dude! Raw broccoli, broccoli. You're like, sick. Squeeze that scratch on me. <laughs> You're sick. <laughs> now, it. I when I when I my wife and I went out and we bought we bought a whole bunch of of chili peppers. We thought, well, well, we're gonna make our own hot sauce. Okay, so uh, we got a fermenting a fermenting and everything. And uh, uh, proceeded to make our hot sauce. Added some garlic, some you know different flavors. Got it in the jar, dude. That stuff was so freaking hot. Okay, my wife couldn't <coughs> even eat it. I mean, you talk about a paint oh. stripper. <laughs> I, I, have, I have no idea where we went wrong, but that. Crap was entirely too hot. I mean, it was like whacked out. I mean, it was, I mean, it would burn your lips hot. I mean, it was unbelievable. So that was the last hot sauce endeavor that, that we tried here. So, uh, so, so we buy our hot sauce now from the store. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Hell. Um, so what's going on uh, around the horn here? You know, I've got some some. You know, we talked about last time in the in the revelations and resolutions and whatnot. I, I'm slimming down things. I'm trimming down things, and I and, and I need to cut down on the amount of brewing that I'm doing. I want to focus on stuff that's easily, you know, stuff that I can you know uh, put in a keg, and you know the neighbors will finish it off on a weekend, on a hot summer day. Uh, I want some easy drinkers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have this formula. I think I, uh, I said it last week, 60, um, what did I say? 60, it's a 60, 40, uh, 60% malt, 40%, um, uh, malt. Now that, honey, or, uh, uh, well, yeah, honey. Yeah. The 60, um, no, how did it go? Yeah, 60% malt, 40% honey. Now, that 60% mm-hmm. malt includes the steeping grains. I don't think I mentioned that on the last show. So, I mean, it, you know, it could be three or four pounds of, you know, dry malt extract along with, you know, uh, other grains that I might throw into a steeping, uh, you know, a steeping pot. So, that's the kind of the, kind of the base formula I want to go with. I'm, 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 I'm tired of doing the the displacement thing with fresh fruit and all that. That just gets out of, out of hand. Uh, so I'm going to go with the Amaretti uh, and use their uh, flavorings. Uh, summertime flavors. Uh, I, I dig the tropical stuff. I like where Aaron's going with the passion fruit and uh, even the peppers. I mean, I could toss a pepper or two in. It would please my wife for sure. I mean, she's the she's the not only the the hop head in the house, but she's also the pepper head in the house. Uh, 
Uh, so she can, uh, you know, she can appreciate that. Uh, but I mean, I got a slew of neighbors here too that, you know, like to come over and drain my, uh, drain my kegs of, of, uh, all my stuff too. You know, I was complaining last week that I had like, I have a four tap, uh, kegerator and I got a single tap, uh, and, uh, <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, I was complaining about having too much stuff. Well, that, that's not always the case, especially in the summertime, because my neighbors like to come over and drain about half of it. Uh, so at least they like what I'm brewing. Uh, of course, it doesn't much, it doesn't take much to get them drunk anyway. Um, so, uh, uh, so that, you know, I'm, I'm looking for doing something. I'm looking to do something, you know, things that are simple, uh, you know, maybe even one fermenter at a time. I'm actually thinking about using the other fermenter as a secondary to the first. Uh, you know, if I want to incorporate flavors mm -hmm. before I put it in the keg, uh, right. you know, that would serve a good purpose because I can, you know, it's also under temperature control. And if I wanted to quick chill it down, I can do that before I stick it in the, uh, uh, you know, put it in the keg. It's already chilled. I, you know, I can, I, an, empty che an empty keg in a small kegerator. Okay, filled with chilled, already chilled uh, braggot. Okay, I can start. I can start immediately on carbon that thing up instead of having to wait, you know, forty eight hours for it to get down to you know the thirty. I think it's thirty one degrees or thirty two degrees, whatever. I have my my big kegerator set at. So, I'm mean, killing right, two right. birds with one stone there. So I dig yeah, that part. You know. Yeah, that sounds like a smart move. Yeah. And uh, Jeff, uh, toss it over to your side of the house, bud. Sure. So, you know, like we talked about last time, we are all about simplifying this year, and I think uh, just making things easier on ourselves and having less waste. And one of my big things was, you know, I'm I'm going to do less batches of mead. Uh, as much as I love the one-gallon batches, you guys know for a fact that I love doing the experiments. Uh, the experiments turn into red redhead is self chilling. They are uh they they wind up either getting forgotten in my little uh cabinet under the shelf and, and you know, go funky or uh I bottle them up and then half of them end up in a milk crate somewhere and I bring them out, you know, once a year when I have company over like, hey, try this. This was interesting. Um I, I I'm really brewing to what I can drink and what I want to drink on a pretty even cycle. So my my plan for this year is basically to do one session-ish mead uh, per season that's going to go into a keg and probably over the course of the year two higher ABV like traditional somethings uh, whether it's you know a traditional or a traditional with one flavor or something like that that you know, they can go in bottles uh, we can give them as gifts for you know hey you know yeah. housewarming here's a bottle of mead here uh, yeah. hey dinner party here we, we brought you some mead you know food. It, it's it's nice. We love to do that for uh, you know guests and um, for you know social occasions, things like that. Uh, so we'll have that going. That's always been a thing for our for us, and there's no reason to stop that, especially when we're giving away like two thirds of these bottles. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to my spring batch, and I know like back at Valkyrie's Horn, I've managed to pick up a 55 pound bag of Canadian Pilsen malt. So yes, you did. There are definitely going to <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you there did. There are definitely some braggots <laughs> in my future and I've been streamlining the way I'm doing my braggots as well. Uh, and I can talk about that on a future pod, a future uh, episode here cuz yeah. I'm cutting out the the burner in the backyard and the boil and the the all that happy stuff and going almost exclusively sous vide. Um uh, yeah. It it's actually working out really well for me and I've just kind of been you know, uh, tweaking my process to make it work right. Um, so, yeah, um, for springtime, though, I'm not thinking bracket. Uh, if you guys remember, I, uh, I've, I've talked a couple times. I have a couple friends that do a podcast talking about movies. Uh, right. The name of the podcast is Movies That Don't Suck and Something to Do yeah. um, with Chris and Neil. And they had me on last year, um, I want to say early in the springtime, for their 50th episode. Um uh, and you know, I I know um, one of the two hosts cannot 
handle his liquor as well as others. So I, <laughs> I decided, you know, I'm going to brew something for you guys. Uh, and I'll, I'll bring it to the show. Um, I, I did a really simple session blueberry mead with some, I want to say it was Simcoe hops, and that turned out really nicely. Um, yeah. You know, I brought probably 10 bottles to that uh, that episode taping. I took four home with me, but, um, you know, the rest of the keg sat in my backyard, um, or not my, my backyard, it was drank in my backyard, sat in my little kegerator inside. Um and it was over fast. So I think that would be a great repeat for a springtime brew. And I just want to tweak it a little. And I've been thinking about how I want to tweak that. Um, as far as process goes, I can't remember if I used a creek yeast or not um, when I was doing that the first time. I'm definitely going to do that now because obviously, you know, creek is awesome. Um, yeah. I tried a little bit of uh, Opti Red based on uh, our buddy yeah. Carvin's suggestion when he was on the show. How did that turn um, out? I've also... How, how'd that turn um, I like out? the Opti Red. Yeah. You know, I've not compared it to without Opti Red, um, but I definitely, you know, the color extraction was really nice. The flavor extraction was good. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that it did what it was supposed to do and got me more of the blueberry character into the mead. Yeah. Um, I should probably at some point do it side by side and see, you know, what this does, what this doesn't do, things like that. Um, in the meantime. Um, I want to say a month or two ago, I also picked up some some other chemicals in that same vein. I've got one called Rouge Boost, and uh, another one which is a uh, a kind of a tannin powder called. Uh, what is it? I'm blanking on the name, but it's actually if if you go to the home brew store, there's you know you get the little wine tannin powders that you get right. um, for for adding tannins to your mead. This one is actually derived from like the bark of red fruit trees, like cherry trees and things oh, like really? that. Uh, yeah, so it, it gives a more of a berry flavor, oh. and it gives some of those. I, I think I'm going to try a little bit of that as well, just for some of those sacrificial tannins we were talking about a couple episodes back, yeah. uh, just to see if I can really bring out that blueberry flavor. Um, at the same time, I wasn't, I wasn't unhappy with the Simcoe hops, but I kind of want to change it up and see if I can bring some different flavors to the the, the party here. Um, you know, we we I've got a good supply of citra hops, which I think would be great with blueberry flavor. Um, I could also see, you know, it, I don't know if you guys have had anything with lemon drop hops, um, but no. I really, I, I I tried something with those, and it's a really fantastic flavor. It reminds me of like the uh, the East Kent Goldings or the Styrian Goldings. It's a kind of a light floral kind of character, yeah. but it's also got a pronounced lemon character to it too. It's very delicate. Really? And very, you, wow. Yeah, I think it would be a great wow. just. I, I think it would play very very nice with the session mead, and I'm gonna try it either with this one or maybe, um, you know, my summer brew. Which at this point I'm leaning towards like a lemon droppy, Kolsch kind of, uh, bracket. Mm -hmm. um, one way or the other, that I, I'm going to play with those. Yeah, yeah you're giving um, me some so ideas, yeah, that's, too. And so here's where we circle back to what I was drinking at the start of the episode, because I was talking about that one with spruce tips. I kind of want to throw some spruce tips in there, too, just because they have some citrusy character. They have a little bit of earthiness. Um, and I think that would play nicely, especially if I have some residual sweetness in that, uh, that session brew. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm leaning for my springtime... Um, you know, five gallon batch here. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I mean, that sounds good. I mean, that's, you know, I, I want to do, of course, we don't have spring here. We have like winter and summer. Uh, one kind of rolls into the other. In fact, uh, you know, sometimes in January we get 98 degree temperatures. So uh, I haven't seen one yet, but uh, I'm sure it's coming. But that's kind of, you know, I want to do something simple, something easy, something low alcohol, low ABV, uh, but flavorful. That's why, you know, I've really been, I've been studying the Amoretti website and picking out, I've got a list of flavors that I, I want to play with. Um, like I said, I, you know, everything's going to basically go into secondary uh, and uh, maybe experiment a little bit with some stuff in primary. But you know, I, I'm I kind of like the idea of using that second fermenter as a uh, 
as a secondary uh, vessel. Um, yeah. I can still keep kegs filled. Uh, you know, and there's, there's actually three brews uh, that I need to do. One is a stout. My wife is the stout drinker in the house. She loves her dark beers. So I must do that. Uh, and it's probably going to be on the lines of a, you know, a bourbon barrel type something or other. Uh, she loves the, the wood, um, uh, goose, goose Island puts out a bourbon barrel. That's just absolutely phenomenal. If you can find it, they're really expensive. One is about 25 bucks for a 12 ounce bottle, but this stuff is like knock your socks off, uh, outstandingly good. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be at least a port or porter. I mean a uh, a stout or a porter uh, for her. A summertime brew uh, to keep uh, keep me and the neighbors happy. And then of course my cider. I mean uh, my cider is a no brainer. That's just store bought, hundred percent apple juice, unadulterated, no no chemicals, no nothing. Five gallons worth, two pounds of honey or whatever it takes to get up around ten fifty five, ten sixty. Nottingham yeast. And uh, uh, I keep forgetting to mention that I put three cans of apple juice concentrate in, two in the very beginning, one at the very end after in secondary. That gives it a more apple flavor. Now, the thing about my ciders, it has to sit a while, okay, for that apple flavor to come through. So we're not using cider apples where you can probably drink this stuff like next week. Um, you know, it's it gets better with time. Ciders, you know, my ciders get better with time. So, I mean, you know, usually about eight months to a year. Uh, and um, so those are the three. I mean, those are the three things that I want to concentrate on brewing uh, this year. And uh, keep, you know, like I said, keeping it simple, you know, just keeping it simple. So I like, it. I, I like the idea of keeping it simple and, and the amaretti flavors. I'm with you, too. I mean, I, I love using fresh frozen fruits, but the displacement and just the, the amount of sludge that you get with that, I mean, it, it can be a hassle. So I, I'm oh all God. about experimenting with those Amoretti flavors. I cleaned out my freezer. Uh, in fact, the batch is still sitting in the fermenter. Um, I, I don't know, it's been in there now for like three months. Uh, eh, maybe not that long. But anyway, I cleaned out the freezer and I had, I had I don't know how many pounds, but I mean, it was like it was it, it was at least 15 18 pounds of berries all various berries and whatnot and i thought well i need to do something with all this so i i put it all in the fermenter with you know with the with the with the yeast and the honey and the water and everything dude i've only got like three pounds or three gallons of maybe three and a half gallons of liquid in the fermenter after all of that displacement <laughs> so yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, you, you, yeah, you put everything in and then you fill it up with honey and water and it comes right up to, you know, like the six gallon mark. And then you go to pull all that fruit out and you got like three and a half gallons of liquid. I mean, you know, I, you know what I've, the I've hell? gotten into something similar. Yeah. I, I didn't mention it earlier, but I, I've got a mixed berry melomel going alongside this tart cherry thing. And, uh, you know, I, I've, feel like I probably put in like three, three and a half gallons of, of water, but then you throw all of those berries in and like you got some sludge that settles down to the bottom. Yep. You, you got some that kind of floats on top and, and you can kind of estimate in between where you've got the nice clear, yeah. you know, mead liquid forming and it only looks like two and a half yeah, gallons. Yeah, and, and it's, it's like, not much, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where's all my meat? Where did it all go? Yeah, I'm done with that. Uh, that's why I say Amoretti flavorings. Uh, that's where it's at for me. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm done with fresh you, fruit. You know? you know, I've got a similar story, and it doesn't even involve fresh fruit. Uh, <laughs> one of those gallon batches that is waiting for me to, to attend to it here. Uh, I think I talked about it before, but I made this with the canned pineapple juice, like the Dole oh, canned yeah. pineapple juice. Yeah, And I, yeah. I, you know, you would think it's just juice. Just and I juice. just, I didn't add water. I just put the juice in. I added honey. Uh, and I made it based on that. Literally a third of this gallon is just 
sludge at the bottom, just the, <laughs> the proteins and the, the pulp and the crud oh, that apparently God. just comes with the pineapple juice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got two thirds of a gallon that is, is just sitting here. Uh, you know, that that's actual meat. And then the, the bottom third, I've got to rack off. Um, oh, and it's crap. like, I started with juice. So I think if I'm, you know, I've, I've got a, um, a coconut flavoring that I'm going to add to it when I finally get around to, to packaging this up. Um, I think, yeah, Amoretti is the way to go if I'm ever going to try another like pineapple coconut or anything involving pineapple uh, in the future just because apparently even the juice is full of crud. Yeah, and the thing, I, you know, uh, yeah. before we get out of here, I mean, uh, the, the reason, one of the, the biggest selling point, the biggest reason why I like the Amoretti product is because they use real fruit. I mean, it's not this fake imitation flavoring, none of this crap. It's the real deal. And I, I've sampled some of the, you know, uh, they've sent us some samples uh, here at the show. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you, you're talking real deal here. I mean, uh, so I, I have no qualms at all about using any of their products in anything that I that I ferment. So with that... Hey, we're going to leave it right there. We want to thank everybody for joining us here at the uh, Meat House for episode number 146. Hey, uh, big thank you to Matt Polensky and Laurel Highlands Meadery. You got to check those guys out. We'll put some uh, information in the show notes. And uh, Aaron Martin for uh, sitting in for Ryan tonight. Thanks a lot, buddy. Uh, you're welcome here uh, anytime. Uh, keep in touch with us, dude. And, uh, hey, don't forget, uh, let us know what you're brewing. We might even give you a call. Email us at info at meathouse.com or send us a message on Facebook or Twitter or both at The Meat House. In the meantime, happy meat making. That's it for this episode. Jeff, flip the lights off. Aaron, you're going to have to slam the door shut tonight, bud. We'll be here <laughs> next week with, with episode 147 of The Meat House. We're gone.